And uh, turn over to John, the book of John, the Gospel of John. We'll be looking at chapter 12, so we're taking a short break, two-week break, exact, to be exact, uh, for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday as we'll be looking in the Gospel of John, and then we'll return. I mean, we haven't left the story of Jesus, but we're just uh, fast-forwarding a little bit, and then... Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll return to where we were in the early stages of Jesus' life and ministry. But this morning, we're in John uh, chapter 12. Well, I think it's fair to say, as a society, that we are obsessed with royalty. And uh, I would say, in particular, we seem obsessed with British royalty, which, uh, I don't know, Somewhat amusing, considering the fact that at least this nation was founded, at least in part, with the rejection of the monarchy, um, and yet uh, we are we are enthralled by uh, the royal family of Britain, aren't we? Right? We scramble to uh, find um, the latest uh, gossip, really, about them, what they're wearing, uh, where they are vacationing, how many children they're going to have, what the next. Uh, Wedding is going to be like, we love to hear about them, don't we? And speaking of weddings, um, you know, it was what, 23 million Americans who watched uh, Prince William and Kate's uh, wedding back in 2011, which exceeded the previous enormous total of, of Charles and Diana back in 1981, which was 17 million American viewers. That's not even to speak of worldwide. But that's a lot of people, right? That's a lot of people interested in, in the royal family. And I, I can still remember as a, as a young, younger child, a boy, um, when Queen Elizabeth, right, we got news that Queen Elizabeth was going to come to California, and it was very exciting because she was going to go to Yosemite. And uh, that meant, you know, for those of us who lived in this part of the, the, the world, the country, that she was going to come very near to where we were. And I can uh, remember people being excited and, and hopeful that they might be able to get in position to just catch a glimpse, right, of this, this woman. And I, I tell you all of that to, uh, to illustrate, of course, our own uh, obsession with these things. But um, also, because this morning we're going to be looking at a story of true royalty, right? The, the king of kings who some 2,000 years ago entered into his royal city in the fullness of time according to the eternal plan and purpose of God and was met with a variety of reactions. Some excited to see him, at least initially, Excited to see what his coming may bring, what it might mean to them. But as we know with the story of the Passion Week, the one who came but was ultimately rejected. Rejected for who he was. Rejected for not meeting the expectations that... The people had for him, at least, right, the, in the eyes of those uh, that we'll read about shortly in the religious leaders. But as we read this story, right, we need to enter into it. We need to not only consider the reactions that we see in this text, but to consider how they speak to our own hearts, our own hearts' attitude and reception of the true king, right? We'll be challenged by even our own expectations and our own anticipation of the one who has certainly come, but will come again, who will come to receive his own to himself and to enter his royal city forevermore. So let's turn now to read John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. This is the word of the Lord. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem 
So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Well, this is the word of our God. Thanks be to God for his holy and inerrant word. Well, as I mentioned, we've fast forwarded in fast forwarded in the life and ministry of our Lord. We 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 enter into that climactic period now in his life and ministry. The the passion narrative as it's called as he uh, enters Jerusalem, he is rejected, he is crucified, he is put to death. But of course, we look to that glorious end of the story or when he raises again from the dead. But nevertheless, that's next Sunday. This, 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 this morning, we're looking at the triumphal entry. And as we look into this text, right? We're, we're, we're sort of entering into it, uh, not completely out of context, but, you know, we haven't been studying through John, so we're kind of parachuting in. And so I want to give you a little bit of the context of, of the story. And, and John uh, at least picks up on uh, the, the idea that this isn't just coming out of nowhere, right? He says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, all right? So the, he, he gives us a time indicator. So it's happening the next day. Well, what, what day, what happened the day before, right? It's probably what you uh, would wonder when you read uh, this text. And it's significant because just prior to this in, in the story of Jesus uh, in John's gospel, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead, okay? Ja- chapter 11 uh, gives us uh, the story of, of Jesus raising Lazarus. And you, you remember the story there, right? This, this man whom Jesus dearly loved had died and uh, was dead in the tomb for four days. And Jesus had heard about this, and so he was deeply moved. And, and so he, he made his way to Bethany, where Lazarus was buried. And we read that that uh, moment in Jesus' life where his humanity is so clear when he weeps for his dear friend. He weeps for Lazarus, and he goes forward, and he gets to Bethany, and he says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came forth. He was risen from the dead, his hands bound, his feet in linen strips, but nevertheless, he is alive again. And, and, and as the story unfolds, it was this sign that God used to bring many right, to believe in Jesus, that he was the promised one. He was the Messiah, the Savior. And, and verse 45 of chapter 11 tells us that many believed in Jesus as a result. And then in the beginning of chapter 12, it uh, records, John does there for us, that it was six days before the Passover, right? And so you remember the Passover is in the middle of the uh, of Easter week, and so it gives you uh, the context of this story. Six days before the Passover, a feast was held in Bethany for Jesus, and a large crowd attended, and again, the result that many believed in him. This, of course, was not pleasing to the leaders, the religious leaders of the day. 
as John 12, 10, and 11 tells us, they sought an opportunity to kill him and Lazarus for that matter. So that is what happened the day before, more or less. <laughs> That's the context of this story. As Jesus now arrives to enter the next day, it says to enter Jerusalem. We're going to look at four parts, brief parts this morning. Uh, number one, an expectation expressed. Number two, an expectation fulfilled. Number three, an expectation unmet. And fourthly, an expectation to come. The expectant king is the theme. First, an expectation expressed. In verses 12 and 13, we read, uh, as we just did, a large crowd uh, that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. Now, according to verses 17 and 18, uh, who was this crowd? This, was, this crowd had come as a result of the witnesses of those who had seen what Jesus had done in Bethany with Lazarus. Okay? Verses 17 and 18 of this story tells us that, they had, had, that the reason that the people went out to meet Jesus when he was first entering Jerusalem was because of the witness of those who had been at Bethany. Okay? Um, and... Uh, so we have to sort of remember not only the, the immediate context, but the bigger context, which is that this was a time of great anticipation, right, for, for Israel, for, for God's people, right? They were, they were eagerly awaiting the arrival of a king, in particular, the messianic king, the promised one, the one who had been spoken of by the prophets. And now they are hearing, or I mean, they've had false prophets, you know, false messiahs come along and had disappointed them. But now they're hearing of this one, this, this one from Galilee who had been doing amazing signs and teaching amazing truths, unfolding the scriptures like no one else before, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. And now, raising someone from the dead. Could this be the one that they had been waiting for? And so, you can imagine that their excitement was, was real. right? I, I think that their motives, when they go out to meet Jesus at this initial stage, are, are genuine. They really do think that this is the King. This is the Messiah. So they go out to meet him. And of course, their actions, I think, affirm this. They, they wave palm branches. Now, this in itself was a significant thing. I mean, not only because this is why we call it Palm Sunday, but, but the waving of palm branches was a, an expression of who they thought Jesus was. Okay, I mean, it wasn't just an expression of joy, it certainly was that, but it was also an expression uh, that was used to celebrate God's sending His people a deliverer, one who would give them victory over their enemies. And so they're waving the palm branches, and not only do they wave palm branches, it says, well, what they said. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. It's a pretty clear expression of who they thought Jesus was. They, they believed that this was the Messiah, the expected King, the promised one, the one who would fulfill all of their hopes and dreams. It's a quotation of Psalm 118. Verses 25 and 26, which is a distinctly messianic psalm, okay? And, and, and there's no doubt that the he that is in view in these verses is the Messiah, the King of Israel. And so the crowd is chanting, praising, screaming his name, or screaming who 
he was. They believed, they hoped at least, that he was the king. But something happened, didn't it? The, the same group of people who were crying out, Hosanna, which means save us now, blessed is the king, here he is. Many of those in a few days would be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. So what happened? Well, he wasn't the Messiah they were looking for, was he? He wasn't the Messiah of their expectations. And we'll get to that in a moment, but first we need to look at an expectation fulfilled. Verses 14 and 15, after the people hailed him as the Messiah, Jesus does something that ironically fulfills prophecy about the Messiah, and yet, as we'll see also in some regard, seals his fate, his rejection. He found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And I should have yelled that because it's an exclamation point. <laughs> it's a fulfilled prophecy. It's Zechariah 9.9, which we read earlier in the service, that the king who would come would come on a donkey's colt. It's a clear prophecy. And so we read this and we think, well, that's great. Here's another confirmation that Jesus is the Messiah. And certainly he is, right? It is the fulfillment of the prophecy given by Zechariah of that future king who would come and accomplish all the things that are outlined there in Zechariah chapter 9. It outlines the, the reality, right, that he would cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem. He would speak peace to the nations. He would rule from sea to sea. He would set the prisoners free. All the things that the people so dearly wanted. But they missed something, didn't they? And it's easy for us, right, to sit. And, and, and before we are too harsh on those um, who rejected him. I mean, they did reject him, so, you know, they rejected the Messiah. But we need to consider, I mean, even the disciples, it says, didn't understand these things till later, right? It wasn't until later that they themselves, right, the ones who were closest to him understood the connection between him coming on a colt, a donkey's colt, and all that that meant. And so what happened? What was so difficult for the people to see? Right? They were waiting for this one that the prophet spoke about. Now he fulfills a prophecy, but then they want to put him to death. What was it? Well, of course, the answer is our third point, an expectation unmet. You see, the people who hailed him as king, and even his disciples, were quick to embrace him as the conquering one, right? The one who would do all those things that, that Zechariah talks about, cutting off chariots and war horses and speaking peace and ruling, all of those things. But they missed the significance, the necessity of what it meant for that same king to come humble and mounted on a donkey. They missed the fact, or at least they didn't embrace it, that the promised one must first come in humility. He must first come to suffer for his people. You see, 
The reality is that ultimately they did not want the salvation that Jesus brings. The salvation that they wanted is, was not a, primarily a salvation of their souls from their own sin, but a salvation of power and deliverance from their political enemies. They wanted a king who would not call them to repentance and faith, but a king who would overthrow Rome by means of military coup and establish his earthly kingdom and give them a special place in that kingdom. You see, they missed the connection not only with the full salvation that Messiah would bring, but they missed the means by which he brings it through humility and suffering. They missed the reality that setting the captive prisoners free can only truly come through the shedding of blood on on Calvary. You see, when the people read Zechariah's prophecy, they were quick to claim the promises of victory over their enemies and the power that that might bring them, but they neglected to see the suffering, the necessary, the necessary suffering of the king. But Jesus, of course, makes this clear throughout his, his ministry, right? In, in Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34, which is just a couple of days prior to the triumphal entry in Mark's account of the gospel, he says to his disciples, we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Disciples still didn't see it. But before we are quick, we look where, right? We look at our own, our own hearts. Because we see ourselves, right, in the, the blindness of the people the jealousy of the Pharisees. And we understand that it is only by God's grace that we can see the truth of the gospel, the, the true nature of the king's coming. And certainly his coming was according to the eternal plan and purpose of God. I mean, none of the things that happen in all of this caught God by surprise, right? They were all ordained by him. And, and Acts 2.23 tells us that. Peter's sermon at Pentecost, he says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Yes, sinners put him to death. Sinners rejected him, and they are responsible for that, but it was all according to the plan of God. Jesus voluntarily offered himself up on the cross, voluntarily was rejected by men. Why? To accomplish the work that God had given him to do, the redemption of his people from their sin. Jesus was not a helpless victim. He was a savior, a purposeful savior of his people. The re religious leaders also rejected Jesus. And certainly it was because of their expectations, right? That he did not meet their expectations. He was not the kind of king that they thought would advance their purposes. But there's also a hint here of jealousy, right? A motivation of, of envy as verse 19 says, look, the whole world has gone after him. 
And there's a great irony in that, isn't there? There's a great irony that indeed uh, the world, people from every tribe and tongue and nation will come and worship the king. But to the Pharisees, Jesus was a rival, a, a, a threat to their agenda. So they too rejected him. And like I said, while it's easy for us to look at the Pharisees and the crowd who turned on him and to wonder how they missed it, we must understand that this too points to our own heart's attitude toward Jesus. Are we not like the crowd who is willing to proclaim Jesus as Savior and Lord uh, when we are caught up in the, the moment, when we are surrounded by other Christians. But as soon as we are faced with opposition, opposition to our beliefs, our faith commitments, and people who dismiss a biblical Christian worldview as outdated and irrelevant. Are we not like the crowd and quick to silence our voice? Or are we not happy to call ourselves followers of Christ as long as everything is going well, but at the first sign of trouble, we begin to question and doubt God's goodness and His love? Or are we not also like the Pharisees, the religious leaders who see Jesus as a threat, a threat to our own agenda, right? We're happy to claim the name of Christ until the call of discipleship contradicts our own plans. Or... We see Jesus as a threat to our autonomy, right? Our ability to do what we want to do when we want to do it, right? We don't want to have to answer to anyone. But Jesus calls us to come and die, doesn't he? to take up our cross and to follow Him. He calls us to give up our own agenda, to give up our own autonomy and to follow Him. Why? Because He is the true King, the King of kings. He's not the monarch of a geopolitical nation, a small one at that. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, the one to whom all our life is owed. Quickly, the fourth point, an expectation to come. See, there's one other thing we don't want to miss from this passage that the crowd certainly missed, but we don't want to miss it, and it's this, that even though Jesus disappointed the masses and did not fit the agenda of the religious leaders. And though he entered in Jerusalem in a lowly estate, humble and riding on a donkey, he did that as a conquering king. He did come as a conquering king. He came to accomplish that which the Father had given him to do. You see, he came to defeat the true enemies of God and his people, and he did that. Sin and death and Satan, not by a military coup, but by offering himself as a sacrifice for us, by humbling himself, being obedient even unto death. He conquered sin and death and hell. He finished the work that God had given him to do. The death blow has been dealt. Sin no longer has dominion over us, and we now are His forevermore through faith in His atoning work. And not only that, 
But the day will come when he will come again. And this time he will not come on a donkey, humble and lowly. But he will come on a white horse, the expected conquering king who will fully and finally defeat all our enemies and bring us into his holy city forevermore where we will dwell with him. And we will catch more than a glimpse of that king because we will behold him forevermore. What a glorious truth. What a glorious reality that will be. And John describes this beautiful picture in Revelation chapter 7. Verses 9 and 10, right, when he talks about the multitude around the throne that no one could number from every nation, from every tribes and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see... The palm, the true palm celebration awaits us when those who worship the true king will do so without end. And so as we close this morning, I'll ask the question, have you had your robe cleansed in the blood of Jesus? If you haven't, then I urge you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ this day and you will be saved and you will join the eternal throng around the throne singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. That you, O oh Lord, did come in humility to conquer our enemies and to save us from our sin. That we, O oh Lord, would have life forevermore. That we, O oh Lord, would have the opportunity to worship you forevermore, to know a joy unspeakable in Christ. And so help us, O Lord, to worship you as our King, but also, O Lord, to, to live in light of your kingship, to acknowledge that you are the rightful ruler of all things, including our lives. And may we, O oh Lord, live our lives in submission to you, that we might glorify you and praise you as a witness to the world around us of your glorious grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.